All right. On the message I'm going to share today, it's uh, part two of last week's message. So I'm just going to briefly recap on last week's message, uh, which was why did Jesus come? And uh, we discussed the common belief within the church is that Jesus came to die on the cross to take away our sins so that we could heaven go to heaven and we defunct it. <laughs> we, we showed in scripture that that was not his purpose at all. It was part of his purpose, but it wasn't the pinnacle of his purpose. But instead, it was to bring a kingdom for him to become king. And we saw through scriptures how it yelled at us that his purpose is to be a king and to bring a kingdom. And so um, we know that he came as king and we know that he said the king is available it's at hand so today we're going to look at the kingdom has come it's something that I misunderstood for many a year when I would pray a famous scripture that Jesus said pray like this in Matthew 6 10 we've sung it in two of our songs this morning uh, the line your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven the picture that I had as I was growing up was that God was on his throne in heaven and his kingdom is in heaven, distant from the earth. And so hence, when I was praying and saying, your kingdom come, it was like I was pleading with God to take action here on earth over a situation and, and him to step in and intervene while I stand back as the bystander. And I would be pleading with him, let your kingdom come, let your will be done in this situation. You know, you whatever your will is. And then there's all types of questions that rise in people's mind. Well, what is his will in this situation? And um, because we don't know that everything Jesus did was a representation of the Father's will. Um, because Jesus was representing the kingdom here on earth. He was the kingdom of God. And... Um, uh, here on earth and so everything he did reflected God's will and so I started to have a mind shift about this and a few verses that I'm going to share today challenged my thinking a bit like the last message challenged our thinking as to why he came when I realized that he came to be a king that he realized uh, that he came to bring a kingdom then I started to think well then if I'm praying for his kingdom to come what does that mean and what is the use of that word? And so, you know, I had to look at what is the kingdom? Where is the kingdom? How does it come? These are the types of questions. I have a very inquiring mind and, um, and I want to know what the answer is for those things. And so I started looking at what is the kingdom? And in this reference and in the, the uh, New Testament, the word kingdom is on a slide for us, Terry, so you could read it. So that you, don't, you know I'm not making things up. What does kingdom mean? I won't even attempt to pronounce it <laughs> in the um, original language. But uh, it's royalty, abstractly rule, concretely a realm, literally or figuratively. And then semicolon, when you see a semicolon, it means these are other words that are used in the Bible that reflect the meaning of that one. They're connected to it. So it's basically a realm, a royalty, uh, royalty and a rule. Um, and so obviously you have a king and the king has a realm. The next uh, slide, please, Terry. Uh, a kingdom by definition is a place and people ruled by a king or a queen. Thus, wherever the spiritual reign or authority of God is in power, that's his kingdom. Simple as that. So Jesus prayed and told us to pray, let your kingdom come. Question is, has it? Has it come? And where is that kingdom and what does it look like? So breaking it down again, a king has to have a people or a place that he is in charge of. That's his kingdom. And so wherever Jesus has spiritual reign, wherever God, because they're both kings, have spiritual reign, or authority, then that's where his kingdom is. My question is, do you allow God to reign in your life? Is he the spiritual authority over your life? If so, you are the kingdom. Yeah? 
And Jesus came to reset what was established in Genesis when man was put in place of ruling and then the enemy deceived him and took that rule and dominion from him and became the ruler of this world. He's bringing it back. In fact, Scripture tells us the earth groans, waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. That's us, for us to take charge again. And um, about to do that, Jesus came in our form and established his ruling, his king, his headship, and we enter into that. So this next part of that verse is your kingdom come. So let's look at come. This is the meaning of the word come, to come or go. And I've done a lot of research on this. It is actually a 50-50 come or go. And in our English language, or when the people wrote the Bible into the English language, they would have looked at this and then gone, mm, is it your kingdom go or is it your kingdom come? Or is it, which one is it? And so they felt that the word come reflected um, what the scripture was meaning. Um, I personally think that the English language the use come has this feeling as if it's lacking, like it's not there. And so we need it to finally arrive. Um, it might be different if we're thinking of a judgment taking place from a judge. But if I'm in a court and I'm waiting for his verdict to come, I still have the judge ruling there and reigning in that courtroom. I'm not asking for him to um, come into the room. He's been there the whole time. I'm just waiting for his judgment, for his rule, his decision to be made manifest. So there's that aspect of come. But as we studied last week, Jesus um, was very clear that the kingdom was at hand, available right there now. John the Baptist's message was that. Jesus' message was that. And it's not saying, you know, it's going to come once you breathe your last. It's going to come in however a period of time before Jesus actually comes back to the earth. Um, it's referring to available as in now, now this time, this second, this moment. Um, and so come is that aspect to it, um, but it also has the word go. So if you were to sing, your kingdom go, your will be done, it changes your perspective. And you're thinking, hang on a minute, I'm actually the kingdom because he rules over me? I'm his kingdom. So your kingdom go? You're saying I need to go into this situation? and manifest your will like Jesus did. Jesus was the kingdom of God and he walked under God's authority. The centurion said to him, I too am a man under authority. And Jesus said, whoa, I have never seen such understanding even in all of Israel, such faith. Because you get it. You understand I'm submitted under the authority of my father and I'm doing exactly what he says and I'm manifesting his will through my life. And that's exactly what his command is for us. And we will study and go on and see that. These are some of the usages of that word come. Um, so in the next slide, please, Terry. It means to come from one place to another. So that's where we get that thinking from heaven. And that's, I think, what has been preached. But there's more aspects. This is biblical usages of it. In other words, the meaning, the word come... Um, it means come and go, and so then they've traced where other scriptures have used it and how it was worked out. And it means to appear, to come before the public, to come into being, to show itself, to find place or influence, to be established, become known, to go and to follow one. And so it's not necessarily a lacking. It actually can be a, just a verdict, a, a revealing of it. Um, it, to show itself, to, to, to reveal its decision in the stuff, um, to bring that influence um, as well as go and some of the other aspects that um, have been shown there. It's more to do with us understanding. Thank you, Terry. You can pop those down now. It's more to do with us understanding what the kingdom is as to know what the come is in the situations. So let's continue to have a look. When did the kingdom first come here on the earth? John the Baptist's message was the kingdom of God is at hand, as I've said, in Matthew 3, 2. Um, in Luke 23, 42. And he, the thief on the cross, was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So we know that Jesus' kingdom 
he was heading into. And he said to him, truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise, that place of his kingdom. Um, again, that's where the emphasis is that we think it's going to be when we die. And this is where the thinking comes from. The thinking is that the thief died on the cross. Jesus is going to die. And so the, kingdom, the, the thief was going to be with him in that kingdom today while Jesus was dead. And hence, it must mean in heaven only. And so this is where we've filled in all the gaps and we've rem removed looking at the big picture. My father always taught me a wise saying and said that um, false teaching is not often built on one verse. Um, we need to make sure we understand the reference to that verse or what the verse is referring to around it. But also we need to check and see um, what else uh, the words in that verse are saying elsewhere to get the big picture of what's going on. And so um, here it's referring to um, him dying and so him coming in his kingdom. I didn't tee up... Um, Ian today when he did communion and he didn't focus on it I thought he was going to but he focused on something else but he mentioned a verse that says that Jesus says I will not drink of this grape juice until the kingdom until I'm in the kingdom with you and uh, and yet when we have um, communion in 1 Corinthians 11 it says to us that we're actually sitting at the Lord's table um, partaking I think it might be actually chapter 10 that says that um, taking the communion with him and partaking and we can't take of the devil's table and we can't take of the lord's table at the same time we can't take of the devil's drink and god's drink and so we actually drink it in the kingdom with him um right then we're, we're having communion so the kingdom is already established um luke seventeen twenty. now having been questioned by the pharisees as to when the kingdom of god was coming okay so when is this coming that's the question we're looking at. He answered them and said, The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will it say, Look, here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. That's Jesus saying it right there. It's like, When's it coming? We want to know. When is it coming? Well, he's saying, It's right now. It's in your midst. It's here. Um, Matthew 4.17, from the same time Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, to make near or approach or to join yourself. That there at hand means to join yourself. Um, Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here, and he was referring to the people alive right then, who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man come into his kingdom. So those people were alive right there and he's saying, you're going to see the Son of Man come into his kingdom, to get his kingdom, grow his king. He's obviously going to be king. That's why he was crucified, king of the Jews uh, and crown of thorns. And now he's going to come into his kingdom and you're going to see it. You're alive, he's saying to them. And you're going to see me come in my kingdom. So when did the kingdom come? Right there when Jesus became king. He became king of a kingdom, which is the people that serve him and choose him to be Lord and master of their lives. He is throned forever, for now and forever, from that point on to uh, eternity. In Hebrews 1, 8, it says, but, the son set of, sorry, but of the Son, he says, this is referring to God, the Father, saying about Jesus, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. Your throne, O God. This is Father God referring to Jesus and saying, your throne, O God, um, because if they share a throne as such, they share a, a rule, is forever and ever. Luke one thirty two. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. No, the throne of his father David is an earthly throne. So we have the throne of God in heaven because that's where Father God is. And he has a dominion and rule there. But Jesus came to take on the lineage of the kingdom of, of throne of man, if you like, here on earth to take back the rule that was destroyed in the Garden of Eden and to bring it back. And he used the throne of David, the earthly throne line. 
and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. So if it has no end, it's started. Right? Uh, Luke twenty-two sixty-nine. 69, Jesus said, but from now on, the son of man will be dressed, uh, sorry, he will be seated at the right hand of the father God. So from now on, Jesus is saying this, from now on, when's now? When Jesus was standing right there saying, now, from now on, all right, the son of man, notice his language, he's not calling himself the son of God, he's saying the son of man, I'm taking on the rulership, rulership that man gave up and the, the rulership of men and he's saying the son of man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So now on, that's when the kingdom started. I think we can see that clearly, that the kingdom of God started when Jesus was standing right here on earth and it's over um, us as people. Daniel 7, uh, 13, he says, I kept looking in the, midst, uh, in the night vision and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. So he's seeing this hundreds of years before. Someone like the son of man. And he came up to the ancient of days, referring to Father God, and was presented before him. So here's Jesus. This is what's happening once he died and he's being presented to, uh, he's risen to life and he's being presented to uh, the ancient of days. And he said to him, uh, and sorry, and to him was given dominion, which is a ruling, glory and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations and men of every language might serve him so so hang on where's the kingdom it must be here on earth because they're people nations men of every language and we're to serve him his dominion will be an everlasting dominion which will not pass away and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed how powerful how wonderful his kingdom is ruling and reigning here on earth and we are his people we are his kingdom and it will not be destroyed the kingdom will not be destroyed so it is now his kingdom is here and it is now what is the kingdom that jesus rules well we've already had many hints to it but it's basically the church so in first peter 2 verse 9 but you are a chosen race He's referring to you right now. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession. Beautiful picture. But connecting it, it's not a race that says we're elitist, you know, like, you know, this particular race of people are greater than the others in the sense because we're like referring to skin tone, you know, nationality. I'll make this up. But, you know, that the Chinese are more superior to the English it's not, it's not that sort of thing because we read like a, in Daniel that the nation, the kingdom is made up of all different nations, of people of speaking all different languages. So it removes, I love it because it removes all that um, thinking of one nation being greater than another nation, one race of people, one culture of people being superior. It puts us all in a mixed bag together and makes us new nation um, but we're chosen, we've been chosen by God to come out of our, our nation, out of our culture. I'm not really Australian. I've been planted here in Australia as an ambassador, but I am actually of the kingdom of God. You are the same. You are the kingdom of God. If you have Jesus as your Lord, not just the Christ that died on the cross, but a Lord, your king and master that you serve, then you are the, the chosen race, a royal priesthood. Notice the language, royal, because we're actually part of the family um, of God now. We're children of God, so that makes you royal as well. A holy nation, a nation. When I look at you, I don't see people that I hardly know, and some of you I do hardly know, but I, even if I don't know you, I know that you are the kingdom of God you then are the same nationality as me. There's something about it when you travel overseas and in a natural sense and like I've travelled to say Cambodia or something like that and I come across an expat 
you know, you come across somebody that speaks your language and understands your culture and the way you've been brought up. It's like <gasps> kindred. You know, you immediately you've got no idea what their background is or anything, but you feel immediate connection with them. I've also experienced this in the Kingdom of God side, where I was in, particularly in Indonesia, when I was in a circumstance that was a life and death scenario uh, on a boat that was on fire in the middle of a, a storm in the middle of nowhere um, and trapped underneath with the fire. And I had, I was me and one other English speaking person and then some Christian uh, Indonesians uh, with me. And the bond that I felt with them as we stood there, they in their language and us in ours, singing praises to God while the boat's on fire, was just immense. It was something that it revealed to me that I had a link with them. Yes, it, it came out of the situation of um, turmoil and potential death, but there was beyond that, there was this bond of love, there was this bond of unity, a bond of faith, a bond of trusting God. And uh, the water, the song that we sang was about, uh, and I didn't even know if they knew it, but they did, that about um, going through the waters and not drowning, being fire and not burning. And, um, and it was an old chorus. And, uh, and so we sang that together in our languages, declaring faith in God, in the situation that was quite bleak and, uh, and saw it all turn around. And, but to know that bond, we couldn't speak the same language, um, but the, that they were the kingdom of God. They were the nation. They were of the same uh, family as me. And, uh, and they have the name of Jesus upon them as well. And so we were um, family. We were there for one another and God... Uh, moved in our situation so we are a holy nation a people of God's own possession so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and we know that's called the kingdom of darkness into his marvelous light or again the kingdom of light there's other verses that talk about kingdom of darkness kingdom of light but our job so that we may proclaim the excellencies of him. We're talking royalty here. It's like we're the herald of the king, that we go out and proclaim his excellency. And uh, we're being called out of the kingdom of darkness into his marvellous kingdom of light. We have been transferred from the rule and dominion of the devil, and we now live under the rule and kingdom of God. And again, as our message this morning at communion said, it's what you remember, it's what you think on as to what you actually uh, have. Whether you live under the rule of the enemy and you let what he says be the final say, or whether you then lose faith and come and say, no, I'm of the kingdom of God, this is not the final this, my Lord's answer to the situation, is the final say. And I serve that and I don't serve this. And it's a powerful um, understanding. Something about the kingdom of light, um, just a memory that's come back to me, is that um, when my younger son took um, some uh, drugs that give you altered, the word's gone from me right now, Thank you very much. Hallucinogenics. Um, he took them. We didn't know. Darren and I were sound asleep in bed. And he took them in his bedroom. And he said he was seeing all these dark figures coming out of the roof, clawing at him. And, um, and so he climbed into bed with us in the middle of the night, woke us up. And um, we said, what are you doing? And he's like, I need you. I've done something stupid. I've taken these things. I'm seeing dark figures, but I can see light around you. And I, I need to be where there's light. And so he came and laid between us, you know. Um, and um, I thought, okay, now I'm awake. I need to go to the toilet. So, um, Darren, you just pray for him. So Darren had his hand on him and I went to the toilet. And while I was in the bathroom the enemy started speaking to me saying, I've got your son, I'm going to kill him, you know, I'm going to destroy his life, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And um, this drug is going to give him harm. And, and I had um, fear starting speaking to me. And I must admit 
that I agreed with it. Okay? I agreed with it in the sense of, oh, no, please, Lord, don't let that happen. I agreed with what the enemy was saying because I responded to it as if it was true, with an emotional response, as if that kingdom of darkness was truth. I left the bathroom and headed back towards the bed and Ethan says what are you doing what have you just done I'm like what do you mean he goes darkness is all around you what happened and I went oh okay sorry Holy Spirit I repent I've walked in fear here Lord I trust you you have Ethan and he's like you're glowing again mum you can come come you're glowing come close come close So I got back into bed. I realized how quick you can actually transfer from being in the kingdom of darkness to in the kingdom of light. Now, obviously, my salvation was not lost in that process, but the enemy was trying to take power in the situation, and I became part of the the problem rather than staying in faith. I learned a very powerful lesson of that. Um, And Ethan, to this day, remembers, it goes like, Mum, you remember? You were light and then you went dark. I was like, yeah, I remember, darling. Um, I learnt a lot with what happens with your mind when you're in a hard situation uh, and you're concerned about something. That we think we're praying sometimes um, with our pleading, but it's just fear and it's just darkness. Um, But we need to actually be walking in the light. And so we our job is to know that we and another verse i love it says you once were darkness now you are light not come light i hear songs that sing this oh let the light of god come let it be no you are light if you've been transformed if you're a new creation and you've been born again you now are light you've been transferred from darkness to light it's just whether we hide it under a bushel like I was doing in the in the bathroom um, or whether we let it shine brightly and so we've got to recognize that verse 10 for you once were not a people but now you are the people of God once we were not family once I didn't know you (laughs) you were from different races indigenous races and English races and Irish races I'm just looking around in some room you know different backgrounds you once were we're not a people but now you are a people or a nation. Uh, You are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Aliens and strangers. What on earth is he saying? Are you little green men? (laughs) No. He's trying to say that we're not really of this world. We're no longer to think within the confines of this world, the structure of this world. We are instead to see that we are the kingdom of God and we're to bring light and life and love and hope and salvation comes via our message uh, of the gospel to this world. Colossians 1.13, For he rescued us from the dominion, the domain, the power, the the authority of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Does that take place when you die? No, it takes place the moment you receive the work of Jesus, the work that he did on the cross and through his resurrection power. This is the communion message. When we hold the bread, we think it's all about um, you know, his body being bruised and battered on the, on the thing. No, the body represents the kingdom. It's the symbol of the kingdom of God called the church. And so we've got the blood under wraps. We understand the blood and what that represents. But we need to start learning what the body represents, the bread represents, and the kingdom of God represents. So that's where a power is. Remember last week we talked about that. That's where the power comes from, the authority comes from. Um, Revelation 5, 9. They sang a new song, Worthy are you to take the book and break its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God. For your blood, for, so with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Matthew 23, 13, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut the kingdom of God off from people. 
and you don't let you do not enter yourselves and you don't allow those who are entering to go in so the the pharisees the people on the earth that time were hindering people from entering into the kingdom and realizing that they could enter in and they weren't going in because they were using religion as a means of trying to get um, to god and so we have to understand that we are the kingdom that his kingdom rules now and forever that jesus is our lord he is our master and that was his main function I'm not saying ignore the cross, but I am saying use it as the doorway and learn to walk into the kingdom, to live into the kingdom. So the church is that kingdom. Ephesians 1.18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what the hope of his calling is, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance with the saints. Whenever you see the word glory, it's to do with authority, a rule, a power. And the glory is the honour and the, the essence. I don't know how to describe it to you. Glory is a very difficult word to explain. But it is, uh, um, there's this honour or weight that comes with glory. And I experience it two ways I've experienced it besides God. I have experienced it with God too when he's been speaking to me. Um, but um, I've experienced it with a police officer when he pulls you over. That is just a person that's pulled you over, but he represents the authority of the land, the government of the land, and there's this weight of respect, oh, you know, that comes with them. Uh, and also when I um, met Prince Charles um, and Lady Di, I met Prince Charles and had words with him. I saw Lady Di. But um, at that point, you see this, there's this essence that they carry, not because they're better people than us or, or superior to us in any way. It's because they represent an authority, the authority that's even above our government, above the police government. Um, and it, there's this weight, there's this essence, a presence um, that's there. And it's very hard to explain, it, but it is very tangible, very real. Um, and you feel it and sense it uh, as a sign of respect more than anything or of honour towards them, and that's glory. Um, And so in the scripture, whenever you read about glory, it's talking about that essence. Um, And I love it because he says, you are now being changed from glory to glory. So you are now carrying his essence, his authority, his weight, uh, his honour within our lives. That's another message in itself. (laughs) Um, And verse 19, what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? That's the question. There are in accordance with the workings of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places. So he was raised up and seated, not on a bar stool, but on a throne. Um, So the moment he resurrected from the dead, uh, his rule and dominion, Uh, has been established far above all rule authority power and dominion and every name that is named not in this not only in this age but in the one to come so not just now as we're living but also in the one when he returns and he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head head means chief king ruler master lord over all things to the church So the church must be then the kingdom, if he's the head of it, the ruler, the king of it, to which is his body. There's the reference to the communion, his body. The fullness of him who fills all in all. I'm hitting you with a lot of scripture today, but I'm trying to do it to show you I'm not just making this up. It's in scripture. It says it over and over again. And I know that many people I've spoken to over time have struggled with this concept and gone, I just don't get it. But I want to encourage you to read the scriptures and look and think of, maybe even write down words that you think might have something to do with authority or a rule or a kingdom. Things like obey. Obey actually means a power above you and you obey it or submit um, to it. There's ruling, there's reigning, uh, there's prince, the word princes, there's all types of things like authority uh, type words in there. Worship is one. We are called to worship. 
we worship our king it's not a slow song it's this it's the heart that says i honor you and i reverence you above my own will above my own life above my own desires i acknowledge you and i bow to you as my superior as my ruler as my lord and master and that doesn't just happen in church that happens when you're deciding what to do about your finances deciding how to respond to somebody who's hurt you who's going to rule in this situation is is darkness and bitterness and unforgiveness or is the kingdom of love and forgiveness going to be what will rule in the situation and so you're choosing continuously when the enemy is attacking you in health issues you'll say well will I submit to this whatever it's called disease or sickness will it be my lord and master will it have the rule and dominion over my life or will I allow the lordship of Jesus to be manifest in my life and so these are uh, ways that affect the way we live and the way we worship our king that we honor him in every situation and we exalt him and you know a famous verse that says in John 4 23 but an hour is coming and now is Jesus is speaking when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and in truth for such people the father seeks to be his worshipers God is spirit it's as simple as that so how we worship in spirit is actually understanding the spirit world the kingdom that we're involved in and those who worship him must worship in that spirit and truth and so his spirit so i worship him by spirit i don't worship him from the natural situation i don't worship him by saying something like um you know the enemy's trying to attack in this way please god help me that's not worshiping it's actually reverencing or worship to the enemy Remember what worship is. Worship is to bow your life in reverence or respect to its power, something else's power, and lifting it up over. And Jesus actually said to um, the guys that were in the boat um, on, out in the ocean with him, he said, why do you fear? That word fear there means to be in awe or reverence to or to worship. So when you fear something, you're actually bowing to it. It's powerful. Yes, it is. It's more powerful than you. But is it more powerful than your king? No, it is not. So hence, I give worship to my God. I can honor him. I can praise him above the situation and seek his rule and his verdict over the situation. That's how you get through hard situations. You worship him um, in spirit and in the truth of the situation what's true here is the devil's power greater no he, we've read that he's been defeated that's why he came remember we read about his purpose last week was to defeat and take the power of the devil away so we come from the truth jesus also says he's the truth and so we come from that living from that jesus commissions his disciples to continue his work of the kingdom um, for the kingdom to go we've talked about the kingdom come when it's come here on earth it's been manifest here on earth it's been revealed here on earth but there's also the other aspect of the word come that's the word go um, so Luke 10 19 Jesus is talking to his disciples he says and so you can put yourself in this place heal those in it who are sick and say to them the kingdom of God has come near you so Jesus was sending his disciples out to go into different places and heal anyone who was sick. And when they got healed, to say to them, the kingdom of God's near you. And, um, and in verse 10, he says, But whichever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into the streets and say, Even the dust of your city which clings to our feet, we wipe off in protest against you. Yet for sure, be sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come near. So that's referring to evangelizing. It's referring to um, manifesting God's healing authority over disease. That's why he what healing's about. That's why we don't see a lot of healing, I think, in the church because we all focus on the cross, sins, whereas we're meant to be living in the kingdom and understanding that cancers and leukemias and uh, headaches and migraines and all these things all these diseases that we get eczemas and asthmas these things are all trying to be 
dominant over our lives, to rule over us, and they come from the kingdom of darkness. They bring death. They bring sickness. Um, they don't bring life or life abundant with them. So we know what kingdom they're from. We also know because Jesus dealt with everyone that came to him with those things and disciplined them and told those things to go. Or whether they're demonic things, he told them all to go with a word because he carried the authority of the kingdom. And so he's saying to his disciples, go out, do the same. And reveal the kingdom of God. Reveal the power of the kingdom of God that is over these diseases and when someone gets healed say to them hey the kingdom is available Luke 9 1 and he called the 12 together and he gave them power and authority over demons and to heal diseases and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to perform healing it's actually a form of evangelism we think it's just for the church it's actually a form of evangelism to go out and pray for people that are sick And then to say, hey, there's a kingdom. You've got all these problems in your life. That's because they're under the kingdom of darkness. Let's transfer to the kingdom of light and you'll have more of this. You'll have his rule over your life and not the enemy. Mark 16, 15, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel of the kingdom to all creation. And he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. But he who has been, he who has disbelieved shall be condemned these signs will accompany those who have believed in my name that name is his character and his authority his power they will cast out demons they will speak in new tongues they'll pick up serpents they will drink deadly poison it won't hurt them and they'll lay hands on the sick and they will recover this is the power and the evidence of the kingdom and so these things challenged me i was like okay you know i can say i'm speaking in tongues but am i able to pick up serpents i don't think it actually means you go and get a snake and you pick it up but it means you handle situations where the enemy is in power that you're not intimidated by it and so i i feel like god's been teaching me to step into that world when i step into um the world of the new age and the the world of the drug users that I've coming in contact through with my son and I go in and I get in among them you know and like I was with Brisbane recently and um, I went to visit him and he had a party happening in his house and I took two other people with me and both of them they're not Christian but both of them were like they have they've got weird things happening these people like there's the horribleness around them like they could see the horribleness around them but I was seeing I was feeling love for the kids and I was seeing hope in them and I was connecting with them and loving on them because I was no longer intimidated years ago if I was in that realm when everybody's doing their rubbish um, I'd be worried about getting attacked I'd be worried about them thinking I'm an idiot um, because I'm a Christian and one I'm an older lady (laughs) Um, and they were all young men pretty much. There was a couple of girls, but they were basically all young guys. But to be able to go in there and to share the gospel, not through preaching necessarily, but by loving and accepting. And I've given prophetic words to them and everything. And um, I've given them all types of um, input from God. And it, as Ethan says, I don't, I'm not using Bible language, mum, but I'm talking God all the time to them now. And I was like, that's right. That's exactly what we need to be doing. And, um, and now, hence, they're starting to want to discuss stuff further. And it's like uh, years ago, I was scared of that kingdom. I was scared of the kingdom of darkness uh, and his power. But now I can go in, I can pick up serpents. I've had the young, some of the young men manifesting and freaking out just because I'm walking towards them. They're freaking out and walking backwards, yelling. Um, and so um, I'm no longer... Um, concerned because I've started to recognize what Jesus has done for me and what's available for me and so I can I can drink deadly poison as in the the words that people say and the nastiness that's there with things it used to poison my own heart it used to hurt me so much but I'm trying to learn how to live in that place where you can drink of those things and it doesn't produce death in you 
but you're able still to produce life into the situation. And that's because I've started to change the way I'm thinking and I'm challenging you to change the way you're thinking. Go beyond the cross, go beyond sin. Your sin has been dealt with once and for all and it's for past, present and future sins. Yes, you repent, um, you say sorry, you change your mind about something, you, you activate uh, what has taken place or as Jesus said, you wash your feet get rid of the dust of this world off you but you are clean because he is with you now it's time to learn to live in that kingdom with authority with power with dominion so that we can boldly um, have these signs and wonders following us or as it says here in john 1 john 4 17 by this love is perfected within us so that we have confidence in the day of judgment, how confident are you when you die in the day of judgment? Because as he is, this is how you get confidence, as he is, so also you in this world. It's not I'm going to try and get there. I am there. Be holy as he is holy. I used to think that meant I've got to be holy. I've got to make sure I'm doing nothing wrong. No, it's actually understand I am holy because he's holy. I'm holy. And so I can be holy because he is holy. I'm righteous because he is righteous, not because I'm perfect, but I activate the kingdom and I live in that kingdom. Colossians 4.17, also Jesus who is called justice, um, and those who are fellow workers of the kingdom of God. So he's talking in there. It's just a reference to the fellow workers of the kingdom of God. So we are to rule. Ephesians 6, 2, 6. Raised up with him, seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where he is, then we are. As he is, we are. He rules, and so we are rules. Remember Jesus says, I am king of kings and lord of lords. That's not referring to him being over King Charles. It's referring to him being over us. We're kings, we're rulers, we're lords. And so he is um, over that. 2 Corinthians 5.20, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Or Ephesians 6.20, For which I am an ambassador in change that chains, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. An ambassador is a high-ranking official that it, um, represents the ruling power that they come from. And it's like they are the foreign country. When um, I grew up in Canberra, there's a suburb there that's full of em embassies. And you can go to those embassies. But as soon as you step from the road onto their property, you are now considered in their country. Simple as that and everything, all the rules of that country apply, all the decisions of that country apply, you are under that country's rule and dominion. And this is the same, you are an ambassador, you now represent the kingdom of God, and where you go, you now are the highest authority. You represent the kingdom of God, you represent your Lord Jesus. And we got to understand that. So when you go to work and situations are ungodly and situations are evil, when you're in a situation, you go in as the highest authority. I remember Linda Janetsky giving a testimony of somebody who was um, manifesting and yelling and throwing the other police liaison officers all around. And Linda is a very small, petite person. <laughs> and uh, this person was throwing all types of strong people uh, around the place and she basically asked them all to go and went in and told the person to be quiet behave themselves if you didn't use in the name of Jesus and all these powerful Christian terms she knew she was representing the authority of God yes she was wearing her police representation for the um, nation but this that was manifesting didn't care about the power of of the police the power of the authority of the land it was saying i am because it was demonic i am the power of this land instead she went in and said oh no you wait <laughs> i know exactly what i'm doing 
and she didn't have to say magic words or do magic things. It comes from the knowledge, the knowledge that Jesus is Lord and Master, the highest ruler, the highest authority in the land, and he has shared that. He's seated me in heavenly places with him. He sat you in heavenly places with him. You do not need to fear. You need to rule. You need to learn to stand in authority and be confident, not in yourself, but in confident in God and his authority and Jesus and what he's done for us and that we are now one with him. And we're not talking about just running in and taking authority over the things that you think need to be dealt with. No, we need to be like the centurion. You speak your word and when I hear your word of authority, I will obey it. That's why the scripture that says to me, I used to quote it wrong. I used to think it said, resist the devil and he will flee. And so I would do all this natural resisting and praying against the devil. But it doesn't say that. Scripture says, submit to God. Submit to God. Yes, Lord. What do you say for me to do? And that in itself is resisting the devil, isn't it? Because as soon as I get God's word for the situation, I'm empowered. I stand on that. I speak that. And hence, the enemy flees. I don't have to even address him. He flees because I'm standing, and that's warfare, standing, standing firm on the knowledge of who he is knowledge of what he has done and his authority and his word, the sword of the spirit for the situation. That's where you win. That's how you overcome. That's how you rule. Not coming up with what you think, but getting God's divine direction and command and then knowing that you are his ambassador, that all of heaven represents is with you now and represents what you're about to say and do. You don't go to pray for somebody because you've got to try and conjure up faith. I used to do that all the time. Oh, well, I'm trying to get more faith, God. I'm going to try and grow in faith. Remember, we get this false teaching that faith is something we've got to try and grow. <laughs> faith is a confidence in him and his truthfulness and what he says. So when he says, sickness, go, go. I don't have to conjure. I don't have to try and... It's not, it's not reliant upon me. It's reliant upon me just simply going, I believe in your power and authority, your verdict in this situation. And I don't know what that's going to be. But you do, God. It's your business. I'm just your delegate. I'm just your ambassador. I'm just the small king, small lord that's ruling and representing you. And so the world that I live in, the people I work with, the family members I'm in contact with, the, uh, the community that I personally come in contact with is the dominion that I've been given to rule in. And so I need to learn how to rule. Um, Matthew 16, 18. It says, I also say to you that you are Peter and upon this rock I will build my church. Now remember the, the church is the kingdom and so Jesus is saying, I'm going to build my church upon this rock. Now that rock, um, not, it's not the emphasis today, but it, that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Is saying the cross and the ruling, you know, the, the work of Jesus, the Christ and the son of God. He's now not son of man there. He's being referred to as son of God, prince, ruler of the, of the kingdom. And so um, Jesus says on that revelation, that's what the church is to be built on. But we see the church has been built on the work of the Christ rather than the work also of the Son of God. I'm not saying we de destroy Christ. We go beyond it and establish the Son of God part, the King, the Lord. Um, and the gates of hell will not overpower it. See, it won't be overpowered when it's built on those things. It will overpower you if you build on only one of those things. Um, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. 
because it's an authority, a rule, it's already been done and so I'm just activating it. Here's a key, let that person out of that prison. Here's another key, let the person get out of that prison. A key certainly denotes access, power to open something or to shut something. It, it denotes the authority of various kinds of stewardship of a royal kingdom, simple. And I love it because it's not a work that I have to try and do. It shall have been. So I just hear what he wants me to do and I do it. As simple as that. It takes the works out of my life. Um, and um, in Ephesians 3.10 it says, So that the manifold wisdom of God might be no made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in heavenly places. We are meant to take the manifold wisdom of God, the the power of God and through the church, through us to the rulers and authorities and kingdoms uh, of heavenly places. In other words, the spiritual darkness, the spiritual forces that we actually go to them rather than them come to us. In other words, I'm saying we don't sit there and go, the devil's attacking, the devil's attacking. We go, no, I'm just laying down in my authority. That's really what's happening. The devil's only attacking because I'm not living from the realm of the kingdom. The devil cannot attack. There's a, a wonderful man, I've forgotten his name. It's gone from me right now, but he was a revivalist. And the enemy turned up and shook his bed. And, um, and he basically rolled over and said, oh, it's just you, and went back to sleep. Now, Smith Wigglesworth, thank you. Now, how does a person do that? How would you feel? you ever been scared at night with sounds in the night? Yeah, I know I have. What if something was shaking your bed and it was moving everywhere and then you opened your eyes and there's this demon standing there? Would you be freaked out? In the natural, all of us would be. But Smith Wigglesworth knew something and that was that he didn't need to fear the enemy. The enemy had been defeated and he couldn't be touched by the enemy because why? He was representing the kingdom of God and God was for him, not against him. And we've read, there's many scriptures, if you look up the word confidence, that we can have confidence. And that's what's lacking, I think, in the church today is confidence in who God is and what he's done for us and thus who you are. Instead, we're continuously trying to deal with issues in our life rather than bringing them to him and saying, you deal with this. You know, when I had anger issues, I'd, I tried everything in my power to deal with it. When I had lust issues, I tried everything in my power to deal with it. It was broken, or well, they both were broken, when I came and said, your Lord, not lust. Your Lord, not anger. You deal with this. Your fruit has to manifest in my life. Your real, your dominion has to be over this. The power of it's broken. But the more I focused on it, the more it became an issue, the more it seemed to have power over me and dominance over me because I couldn't be free from it. And so I was yielding to it and serving it. But when I shifted from that and said, ah, no, I'm awake up to that. I'm not serving that anymore. I'm serving you, Lord. You are my Lord. You are my master. And you are over it. And you deal with it. I submit to you. And in thus I resist the devil and he will flee. Simple as that. So, ending it, what Jesus' purpose was, was that he would establish a rule that is the kingdom, the kingdom that you've been invited to join, to live under his rule, to represent the kingdom in this world, in this kingdom of darkness, in this time, inviting people to join the kingdom. Now you've all been given a very clear description of who you are, You've all been given a clear understanding of your destiny, of your purpose, of your role remaining here on earth. No matter how old or how young you are, your role is to walk in the power of the kingdom and to reveal the kingdom to others and to invite them to come rule. We are to come and go. And we're going to end very quickly on this song again, if the team could come up. Your kingdom come. And we're going to sing it again because I want us to think about the words because previously I almost guarantee when you were singing your kingdom come, your will be done, you were doing what I used to do, thinking it's way out there. I want you now to pray your kingdom come, 
your power, your authority. I am your kingdom. Your will be done. And understand it's actually an activation as well for us. That his kingdom has come to this earth. His rule is here now. We are his kingdom. And we are to come and go into all the world and preach the gospel.